We are back for part two. Doctors, nurses are amazing human beings and this is not at all to slight them, but unfortunately, where there is good, there are often bad people too. So today, we are covering our top 10 list of messed up treatments doctors lied about part two. From blatant lies to dreadful FDA recalls, we got a lot on this list, so get ready. Number 10, starting off with this one, trepanation. Someone had to make this stuff up. Someone had to be the one that said, hmm, I don't know how to solve this, so here's something that we can do in the meantime. What was it? A hole in the head. This treatment can be traced back all the way to the Incas. After a skull was found with a deliberate hole in it in 1865, it was brought to the New York Academy of Medicine. All the way up into the 19th century, even though doctors knew how dangerous it was, this method was practiced to alleviate a whole bunch of things. It was even used in medieval times to help expel the humors from the brain. Like I know people were hard and fast about their faith back then, but I would have been terrified to go to the doctor. The practice was so dangerous that there was a joke that the surgeon himself must have fallen on his head. It remained a common procedure for head wounds despite the incredibly high mortality rate. Today, doctors still drill holes into the skull in order to access it for life-saving surgeries, but trepanation is not really practiced now, thank goodness. But mm -mm, imagine a doctor trying to convince you that it's a great idea when you, like, your neighbor died from it. Number nine, fever therapy. So imagine someone saying, hey, so we see you have hysteria, so we're gonna infect you with scarlet fever to see if that makes that better. But then of course, even if it did miraculously work, you still have scarlet fever. I don't understand. That is a very poor example to illustrate a very poor medical treatment, but it was actually a real thing. Some doctor, again, was at a loss for ideas at some point, so they infected a patient with something they could cure and it caught on. That's what I think anyways. Fever therapy was a very real therapy that goes back even to the ancient Greeks. They observed that a period of fever sometimes worked to rid people of other symptoms. But it wasn't until the 1800s that doctors decided to use it to treat mental illness. Julius Wagner Jareg infected a patient with syphilis with malaria to help cure the psychosis caused by syphilis. Though it did bring the patient out of delirium, it didn't cure them of either diseases. Now they've got malaria too, good job. Though it is true that fever is a part of our body's defensive procedure when it comes to fighting disease, but <laughs> nowadays it's like having a fever means it's a bad thing. It is no longer used as a therapeutic cure. Imagine a doctor saying that to your face, like, hey, you've got this deadly disease, but we think this, this other deadly disease might cure you. Number eight, dinitrophenol. You would think that the logical next step after encountering a drug that kills people is to avoid using it at all costs, especially for like medical practices. Dinitrophenol was discovered in World War I by munitions workers who died after contact with it. But scientists were like, nah, this probably isn't so bad. They discovered that in a three to five milligram dose per kilogram of body weight, it could actually increase the body's metabolism by 20 to 30%, a potential aid in helping obesity. Yay, a miracle weight loss drug. However, it worked so well that the dosage just kept creeping up. Patients started developing high fevers, 109 degrees Fahrenheit for instance, heavy sweating, and hypoxia. Due to its highly toxic effects, the chemical fell out of favor. It is now primarily used as a pesticide and in shellite mixture used for explosives. So I don't know why that ended up in our bodies at one point, but all to lose a couple inches, eh? Great. Uh, number seven, Vioxx. Vioxx was one of the largest drug recalls in history. Because of this recall, the FDA and Merck, Vioxx's producer, received harsh criticism concerning their approach around potentially dangerous substances. The drug was used as an anti-inflammatory that was used for people with arthritis. But soon, researchers discovered that it increased the chance of heart attack and stroke. By soon, I mean after over two million people had already used it. Over 140,000 people suffered from coronary heart disease because of Vioxx. Both the FDA and Merck were accused of ignoring evidence that said that this was what Vioxx could cause and each settled for $4.8 billion. Number six, John Bodkin Adams. No one saw this coming, why would they? Doctors are heroes, which is true, but there are those who abuse power and unfortunately, many of them are very good at lying, such as Dr. Adams. Dr. Adams was a general practitioner in the community of Essex, England. Everyone loved him and he was especially compassionate towards elderly patients. However, he would often prescribe risky drug treatments and he was strangely involved in his patients' wills. 
Yeah, you can see where this is going. In 1956, police finally grew suspicious of Adams as they found several patients who had willed him large sums of money. They found dozens of suspicious cases, but he was only charged for two. But even despite that, it wasn't the mysterious deaths that brought him down, but the forged prescriptions and medical forms. But the worst part about this case was that Adams was actually reinstated in 1961 and was able to reopen his practice after all this. Great, I don't know who's worse. The people who allowed him to like continue practicing or Adams himself. Number five, Marcel Petiot. In this case, it wasn't so much what he did in his practice, but what he did outside of it. Petio was a highly intelligent child, even besides his, you know, some would call unusual behavior. He was expelled from school multiple times and arrested by the time he was 17 for mail fraud. He was never tried though, as he was deemed mentally unfit. He then joined the army, but then was discharged for thievery and mental unfitness as well. But he did turn it around for a time by earning a medical degree and becoming a decent doctor in Villeneuve, France, until two of his patients died mysteriously or were murdered. He was never charged. He moved to Paris in 1933, continued practicing, then World War II hit and France became occupied by Germany and he had an awful, horrid idea. Disguised as a member of the resistance, he offered help to Jews looking to escape. Once alone, he injected them with poison saying that it would help protect them against disease while they traveled. After he watched them die, he stole all of their money and belongings. After the liberation of Paris in 1944, 30 corpses were found in his basement, though he admitted to killing 60. He was guillotined in 1946. Good riddance. Number four, Lyme disease. This is a weird one. Lyme disease is a very real tick-borne illness that for some reason is incredibly difficult to diagnose to the point where some doctors just dismiss it right away. Canadian singer and icon Avril Lavigne has been very vocal about her experience with Lyme disease and the difficulty that she had getting diagnosed. She told Good Morning America that she saw several doctors and stated, I was in Los Angeles, literally like the worst time of my life and I was seeing like every specialist and literally the top doctors. But still, it wasn't until she actually went to a specialist that she got properly diagnosed. They told her that she had chronic fatigue or depression or that she was simply dehydrated and exhausted from all the performing or that she had the flu, anything but the actual disease. This apparently is a very common occurrence with people who have Lyme disease. If a doctor is not familiar with the territory and doesn't know what signs to look for, then they just hand out a blanket diagnosis. Even Daryl Hall from Hall & Oates had the disease and was told it was just a flu until he was finally diagnosed after talking to family members who had Lyme disease. Be careful, if you've been around ticks and you've gotten any of these symptoms, tell your doctor. Number three, Titicut Follies. That is the name of the documentary that uncovered the horrendous treatment given to patients at Bridgewater State Hospital. Filmmaker Frederick Wiseman observed the hospital for 29 days all the while filming the harsh, cruel treatment by the correctional officers. One inmate was a paranoid schizophrenic who came there to be tested, but ended up staying there. Despite complaining to the board that he was going through some pretty ill treatment, his case was dismissed and was given tranquilizers to keep him down. He wasn't the only one who was treated poorly like this. The documentary highlighted how unaware doctors were of the proper treatment appropriate for the mentally ill. Some patients were starving, scolded, beaten, and otherwise neglected. This is one example of of poor treatments in asylums with a history of treatments that involved binding, starvation, simulated drowning. It is obvious that doctors had no idea what to do, so they either did nothing or tormented the patients. Thankfully today, mental health is taken a lot more seriously and is treated with care, but there is still plenty more to do. Number two, DES. Trigger warning for the next two, they do deal with uh, pregnancy and miscarriage. As a reminder, the 1950s didn't have the same rigorous testing that we have now, but that's not really an excuse. DES was prescribed for over 30 years as a way to help prevent miscarriages and complications during pregnancy and childbirth. At the time, doctors believed that some women didn't produce enough estrogen for safe delivery, which wasn't the case. So DES, a synthetic form of estrogen, was made to combat this. But research revealed it wasn't effective for one, but doctors still prescribed it, even though they knew it wasn't really effective. Like, we need more estrogen, man, we don't. 
Finally, in 1971, the FDA released a drug bulletin warning that the drug causes a rare form of vaginal cancer. The Supreme Court of California ordered all DES manufacturers to pay a settlement proportionate to their share of the drug market. And last but not least, number one, thalidomide. Thalidomide was first introduced as a medication in the 1950s to help control symptoms of morning sickness. But now that aging thalidomide generation faces skyrocketing medical bills as it was soon discovered that the drug was extremely harmful to infants. Common side effects included the absence of arms, deletion of ears, deafness, defects in the femur and tibia bones, and many, many more. Tens of thousands of children across the world were born with these defects as a result of this drug. What was first advertised as the most versatile drug soon became a heartbreaking scandal. According to the BBC, as of 2011, fewer than 3,000 are still alive, which is funny. I was actually speaking to my dad on the weekend about this, and he remembers when he was a kid, my mom as well seeing so many thalidomide babies in their school. And he was like, now as an adult, I never see them. And this is why, because most of them didn't survive very long. Though compensation was dealt out, many survivors got little to nothing to help. But a possible link to a World War II German war criminal could bring more compensation. That's right. German scientist Chemie Grunenthal was said to have first patented thalidomide. But it was recently confirmed that the German brand name was owned by a French pharma company that was under control by the Third Reich during World War II, meaning that it might have been developed in prison camps. And they marketed this drug to people across the world for anyone to consume. Even scarier, thalidomide is still used to control serious types of cancer and leprosy to this day. Still being used. Anyways guys, that was our list for today. If you liked it, you know what to do. Comment, subscribe, blah, 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 blah. You, know, you know the deal. I've been your host, Rachel Fisher, and until next time, take care.